a young hiker, out photographing the Canadian coastline, makes a catastrophic decision. I instantly got the feeling you get when you're going over the top of a roller coaster. I knew that I was going to be quite a mess at the bottom. Ah! The fall leaves him with terrible injuries. Ah! It wasn't just a little crack. Bone was definitely separated from other bone. Stranded on a remote beach, his only hope is to drag his broken body to safety. I had to get to help or I was going to die. There's really no two ways about it. But when no help comes, his only chance of survival lies in overcoming one final unimaginable challenge. Ah! By that time, pretty much figured that I wasn't going to be making it out no matter what I did. Twenty-six year old Canadian Jordan Nicurity has a passion for the great outdoors. After finishing his degree, he worked on organic farms all over Western Canada before losing his heart to the tiny island community of Hornby off the country's North Pacific coast. There's a real sense of community, people helping each other out, everyone knowing everyone. Uh, that's, that's something that really appeals to me. Hornby has one small settlement and only a scattering of residents. There's a lot of great people there, and there's not too many people there, so those are two things that I sort of value. And it has another major attraction, kilometer after kilometer of hiking country and a wild and windswept coastline. There's lots of great hiking around there, huge sea cliffs, uh, the sandstone formations are really quite unique. It's just gorgeous, really a picturesque place. Jordan runs a small gardening business, but he grabs every chance he can to take off on a hike. Today, he's heading for a remote beach on the island's easternmost tip. He'll take some nature photographs and be back home where he lives on his own by lunchtime. It was sunny, but it was still you know, the end of October, so I threw in an extra big wool sweater, I made myself some tea, I threw it in my backpack. threw my bag over my shoulder, and instead of just following the trail, I just decided to go bushwhacking. It was definitely a bit of a scramble up and over some logs and, and that sort of thing. All stuff I like doing. Half an hour later, Jordan reaches the coast. 10 meters below is the famously inaccessible Mushroom Beach. The way down to the beach is uh, kind of treacherous. It's tricky to climb down. The steepness of the descent keeps most people away, so it's kind of nice and secluded. There's a rope that someone had tied to the base of a tree near the top to sort of help over this one bit, which is pretty close to vertical. So I just hung on to that and, and followed that down. It's a tricky climb, even with the aid of the rope. Jordan knows the only way off Mushroom Beach is to climb back up the cliff. But that's a problem for later. Hornby's vacation season ended weeks ago, so he has the place all to himself. The only sign of life on the beach is a makeshift wooden shelter. No, it was sort of a, a neat thing to look at. I took quite a few pictures of it. Well, I plop myself down on the beach and lean back and sort of relax for a few minutes. 
and pulled out an old 1970s National Geographic that I'd gotten at the free store on the island and proceeded to uh, while away the next hour or so uh, just reading. The breeze was nice and warm, the tide was out, the, you hear the waves crashing a little bit. It's about as peaceful as you're gonna find. After his break, Jordan sets off to look for images that inspire him. I started as a newspaper writer and the photographer there taught me a few things and I fell in love with it. There's lots of unique stuff on Hornby to keep the rolls going through the, the camera pretty easily. Jordan heads north in search of the sandstone rock formations the beach is famous for. That was part of my mission. I was going to go take some pictures of the, the sandstone. After exhausting all the ground level angles, he starts looking for a high vantage point. The cliff wall is continuous all the way around and I spotted a, a ledge about halfway up that looked like it would be quite a nice perch to get some good shots of Vancouver Island on the horizon. I decided to leave my camera up and see if I could make my way up it. And then if uh, it looked like it was a decent spot, then I'd lug my bag up. Uh, it was quite a big camera bag. I had all my gear in it. I was wondering how I was gonna get up there. There was no obvious route. I've always been one to sort of enjoy climbing trees and uh, scrambling over boulders and that sort of thing. So it was pretty easy climbing. You know, I didn't have to find any handholds or footholds or anything like that. But the higher Jordan climbs, the steeper the cliff becomes. I've made my way up quite a treacherous little section. The cliff right there, it's pretty much vertical. He then hits another problem. To get to the ledge, Jordan has to clamber around a bulge in the rock face. Jordan thinks about giving up the climb. He knows a slip from this height could prove fatal. He really wants that shot. If I just reached around to sort of uh, shift my way around it, virtually as soon as I got my fingers into this crack, this rock came off. I had my footing on the ledge, but not my balance for what seemed like an eternity. And I watched this rock go down. There was a good one Mississippi, two Mississippi before it, it hit. I looked at it and I, and I thought, oh, that's me next. I knew I couldn't keep my balance and instantly got the feeling you get in your stomach when you're going over the top of a, a roller coaster. The adrenaline kicked in right away. I knew that this wasn't gonna be a little twist your ankle sort of fall. Below was just a bunch of jagged rocks. I knew that I was gonna be quite a mess at the bottom. I was thinking I was gonna have to be sponged off the cliffs pretty much. When I first started falling, time seemed to slow about as close to stopping as it could. That was sort of the most uh, surreal part of the fall, but uh, it didn't take long for gravity to speed it back up again. And then suddenly I was on the bottom. There I was at the bottom, staring up at the blue sky and where I had just been, uh, up on the ledge there. And um, I could feel that 
there'd been a, a big impact. My head was uh, definitely swimming. It just hurt. But I was surprised I wasn't dead. That was my first thought. I was more happy than scared at that point, just because I realized the, you know, the fall was over and I still had my brains in my head. It's a miracle he's alive. But Jordan can't believe he's escaped serious injury. I knew I couldn't have gotten away from a fall of that height scot-free. The first thing I did was check my head. I figured I must have given it a pretty good whack. Nothing felt broken, and everything else was looking pretty good. So I was sort of enjoying these small victories. He remains cautious. My next fear was that I'd broken my back somewhere and wouldn't be able to, to move my legs. Paralysis is his worst nightmare. It took me about five minutes of laying there to get the courage up to try and wiggle my toes. When I did finally get the courage and, and they moved, I was ecstatic. I felt that if I was still alive, if I wasn't paralyzed, then anything else would be inconsequential. My next mission, I suppose, was to see sort of what shape I was in beyond those two basics of still being alive and still being able to, to move my legs. As soon as I tried to roll over, I could sort of feel the bone them grating against each other. I immediately knew that something was, you know, very, very broken. I heard a, heard, I don't know if heard is the right word, you, you sort of feel it more, um, a crunch. I was sweating from the from the pain and from the shock, and I reached behind and just gently sort of uh, was touching my hip. I was very aware that it wasn't just a little crack. Where once there was smooth bone, there was now a couple of jagged pieces sort of grinding into each other um, and was pushing against the skin. The fall has completely shattered Jordan's pelvis. It's a horrific injury that effectively separates his right leg from the rest of his body. Standing is out of the question. He tries to turn onto his stomach so he can at least crawl. Jordan realizes the terrible situation he's in. He's left his mobile phone in his van. He lives on his own, so no one will be looking for him. And Mushroom Beach gets almost no visitors this late in the season. Jordan is completely on his own. I knew that the seclusion of the area was definitely not in my favor. Jordan lives alone, so it could be days before anyone notices he's missing. His first priority, to find warmth before the chill of the North Pacific night sets in. My mind went back to the beach and all the driftwood there. My plan was to somehow get back there and have myself a nice cozy bonfire.
Jordan breaks down his survival plan into single manageable tasks. First, he must crawl the 100 meters back to his backpack. I knew I'd have to get back to my bag, which had this warm wool sweater and that last gulp of tea that I kept in the bottom of my thermos. But first, Jordan must shift onto his front. His horrifically mangled pelvis turns this apparently simple task into a nightmare. It's a pitifully small victory with a terrible cost in agony. And it's only a start. I started to pull myself forward with my arms. As soon as I tried, I would just get nothing but overwhelming pain, and uh, my body just wouldn't work. The 100 meters feels more like 100 kilometers. Every movement grinds the edges of Jordan's broken bones together ah! Ah! and tears at flesh, muscle, and nerves. Ah! It's all taking way too long. I remember watching old old movies where people would be in some sort of discomfort and uh, either biting on a bullet or biting on a strap, you know. So I thought I'd try it. Biting on the belt takes his mind off the pain, tearing at his torso. I put a lot of pretty deep uh, indentations into the strap with my teeth. But the terrain constantly throws up obstacles that block his path. There's boulders the size of cars, there's boulders the size of Lazy Boy recliners, there's boulders the size of one-bedroom apartments all around this area. And as I was only about a foot and a half off the ground, I couldn't really see sort of what was beyond the next boulder. Give me a break. It was very, very frustrating because every inch was being bought with a lot of pain. It just became a, a landscape conspiring to keep me from possibly living. Sort of a prison that I had to get out of. Although Jordan makes steady, if painful, progress, the terrain just gets tougher. There was sort of a slot between two boulders that I couldn't get through just pulling myself sideways. I sort of had to prop myself up on my arms and swing my legs underneath. In his bid to clear this latest obstacle, Jordan gets hopelessly stuck. I couldn't move, I couldn't go forward, I couldn't go back. I was sort of stuck because I, I couldn't get my right leg to follow the rest of it. It was just sort of being dragged behind. Help me! Although I knew that, you know, with the wind and everything like that, that no one was gonna hear me, I just started yelling for help. Somebody help me, please! I probably was there 15 minutes or so, and you know my arm strength started to give from holding myself up for, for that long. He has to act, even if it means risking further damage to his shattered pelvis. In the end, the only thing I could really do was just pitch forward onto my shoulder. And try and shelter my, my right side as, as much as possible with my left, but... The, uh, the leg bone's connected to the hip bone. So when I did that, that was excruciating. <sighs> 
It's taken two hours of agonizing progress to travel 40 meters. And Jordan's not even halfway to his bag. But he's totally exhausted. As he braces himself for his next effort, he makes a horrifying discovery. He didn't notice the tide coming in. Now, it's just a few meters away. I knew I was below the high tide mark, and if I couldn't make it above the high tide mark, I wouldn't have lasted five minutes. The sound of the waves against the rocks only about two and a half feet you know, below from where you are, and there's a long way to go. You have a lot of time to think about you might not get out. Jordan makes it to higher ground and his bag. By the time I made it back to my bag, it was dark. It took me four hours to get the roughly 100 yards, 75 yards back to my bag. It's taken four hours to travel a distance that took less than a minute before his fall. His reward is a mouthful of hot tea and a thick wool sweater to help him get through the coming night. The temperature was dropping quite quickly as it was getting dark. To be able to pull into this magic bag and pull out you know, some chance of salvation was, uh, was great. Jordan hunkers down for the night. It's a beautiful night out. You know, the gentle lapping of the waves and, and all that, it, it would have been quite an idyllic spot if I wasn't in the circumstances I was in. He knows that whatever agonies he's endured today, the next stage of his journey will be much further and much harder. I knew that I'd need strength for the next day, and to do that, I'd need to sleep. But that was virtually impossible. All I could do was sort of lay on my back and, and fade out maybe for 10, 15 minutes at a time, and then I'd shift, and just the pain would wake me up. I would wake up and wonder where I was, and why I was laying on this uh, rock ledge instead of, uh, you know, in my warm, cozy bed. Every time I remembered what had happened, it was definitely a, a feeling of dread. Bitterly cold and in pain, his sleep is broken by terrifying flashbacks of his fall. Every time that I would just about fall asleep, it was me falling off the cliff again. It was a very long night. I was quite happy when the sky started to, to lighten because that, that meant I could stop killing time there and, and start moving again. Jordan's not expecting anyone to find him. Nobody comes down to the beach this late in the season. All he can do is keep going, back to the pebble section of beach. He'll use the wood there to start a signal fire. But it's nearly 400 meters away, four times as far as he traveled the day before. I had figured out that if I took the strap and wrapped it around my right leg, I had a pretty good handhold that I could sort of use to, to pull my leg along with. The strap stops the leg from pulling on his crushed pelvis allowing him to cover ground twice as fast and with less pain. The new technique is a revelation. It wasn't such a, a struggle, and, and that, in a way, gave me hope. What Jordan doesn't know is that he also suffered serious internal injuries in the fall. With every hour, his chances of survival are slipping away. 
all these rocks are sandstone. Uh, so I was, uh, it was like pulling yourself over sandpaper. It didn't take long before my fingertips, I'd scraped them off past the nerves, past where I could feel that uh, they were hurting at all. Just keep going. The rocks are now destroying his legs as well. The sandstone had worn right through the pants and right through most of my leg. I was pretty sure that I'd worn through the skin and the top muscle and the, and the bit of nerves as well. Every centimeter of progress he makes is tearing him apart. I just keep going. Unable to escape the mid-afternoon sun, Jordan is becoming severely dehydrated. The dregs of tea in his thermos are long gone. Tormented by thirst, he's surrounded by water he can't drink. These shallow pools had formed in the sandstone. I knew most of it was salt water but I was so thirsty. I was hoping that the salt content would be low enough that it wouldn't hurt me. Dragging himself through the salty rock pools is torture to his open wounds, but it's the quickest route. Throughout the day, I could feel bone sort of grinding against other bone. Ah! I knew I was getting weak in a hurry. That my situation was definitely on the downward uh, spiral. Jordan's worsening internal injuries are taking their toll. His head throbs and his vision blurs. But then, among the waves, he spots something. I could see in the distance a kayaker. 26 hours after his horrific fall, rescue is at hand. I yelled as, as loud as I could, you know, tried to wave my arm. Help me! Help me, please! I kept watching it, and it didn't seem to be getting closer or further Help away. Help me, please! Somebody! Over here! After a little while, I realized that what it was was just a rock. That was just kind of jutting out of the water. Jordan is losing the battle between his body and his mind. No, no! And there's worse to come. He's only halfway back to the beach when the weather suddenly turns. I was very cold, soaked right through, and I realized that the wood on the beach would be pretty soaked as well. Desperate to reach shelter, Jordan presses on. With every raindrop, my chances of lighting a big signal fire on the beach um, shrunk. <laughs> hour by hour, fingertip by fingertip. Finally, an incredible 30 hours after he started his grueling marathon, he reaches his destination. It's too wet to start a fire. But at least the wooden shelter he photographed yesterday offers some protection from the elements. Thank you. Thank you. 
The shelter wasn't waterproof or, or windproof by any stretch of the imagination, but compared to the outside, it was definitely the Ritz to me. There was no way for me to get dry. I just kept on my wet clothes and uh, tried to keep to as small a ball as I could to sort of try and conserve my body heat. I knew that the possibility of meeting my end from uh, exposure was becoming very real. Jordan discovers that drinking water from the tidal pools was a mistake. <laughs> I just laid there and wretched up seawater for half the night. I was just feeling so awful. That was probably the longest night of my life. In the freezing darkness and in the depths of despair, Jordan's thoughts turned to his parents and his brother, Justin, back in Saskatchewan. I was thinking about my family, but not so much about me seeing them again. I was thinking about how crushed and how sad I would be if the situation was reversed, how frantic and how you know, devastated I'd be if, if something like this happened to my little brother, Justin. Um, we're pretty close. If I was sitting at home cozy and he didn't make it out, His family are used to hearing nothing from him for days on end. By the time they discover he's missing, he could be dead. Now I'd sort of stopped hoping that someone was going to come down and find me and, and realized I would have to find people as opposed to them finding me. If I was going to make it, I had to get up to the cliff. The sheer cliff he climbed down two days ago to reach the beach is the only way out. It was a struggle on the way down, even when he was fully fit. Climbing up the cliff without the use of his legs is surely an impossible task. I either had to get to help or I was gonna die. Um, there was really no two ways about it, and uh, when your choices are put that simply, it's, uh, it's, you don't need a lot of mo motivation to, uh, to carry on. I was at the bottom looking up from a foot and a half off the ground. It was very daunting to, to look up and, and see the size of it. I can't believe I'm doing this. I wasn't sure that I was going to make it. Ah. Jordan faces a vertical climb of some 10 meters. He'll have to rely on the strength in his arms to haul his entire body weight up the rope. Here we go. But there is no alternative. If he doesn't attempt the climb, he will die on the beach. One, two, three. Ah! My hands were more hamburger than hands, and um, just with my strength, uh, my injuries, the odds were definitely stacked. Using my hands as much as possible to brace myself. I was being so painstaking in choosing which rocks I would use for a handhold, knowing that if I made the wrong choice, that that would be the end of me. Jordan knows he can't survive another fall. His crushed pelvis means his legs are useless. All he can do is trust the strength in his arms and pray that the rope holds. He's nearly at the top when the unthinkable happens. 
the rope came undone from the tree that it was attached to. And I was very lucky not to tumble back down when that gave way. Luckily, it gave me half a second to reach over and, and grab the nearest rock and somehow keep from falling. Jordan realizes with horror that his arm muscles are about to give out. My arms were just dead logs, and my grip was becoming weaker and weaker, and it was uh, becoming apparent that something one way or another was going to happen pretty soon. It was the scariest point of, of the whole thing. Jordan calls on the last drop of strength in his failing muscles. I was very aware that I, it was do or die. I was just completely out of strength. Uh, in my arms, I couldn't feel my hands. I couldn't get my fingers to flex. And they just weren't able to keep a solid grip on uh, any rocks. There were now just centimeters standing between him and safety. If I didn't get above it, I would die. There was no, no question. And if I fell from this, this wall as well, I would die, and there's no question in that. With the slickness of the rocks and the lack of feeling in my hands, uh, it was a pretty perilous way to sort of maneuver, but that was all I could do. If he slips now, then his grueling two-day ordeal will all have been in vain. If I made a wrong move here, I was either gonna die or, or be paralyzed. He's made it. When I found myself down top, after I'd flopped myself over the, the top of the vertical bit, I, I really felt that I'd gotten past the, the worst of it. But it's come at a terrible price. I had cuts everywhere, as broken up as I was, so near complete exhaustion that I couldn't move a muscle for probably 10 minutes. But I'd felt like I'd just climbed Everest. Jordan's achievement is superhuman, but it's only one small step towards survival. It's taken him two days to cover just 500 meters. The main road is almost three times as far again, and he's chronically dehydrated. I was still in the same predicament I was in when I was at the bottom of the cliff, very badly injured, and although physically closer to getting help, there's no sign of it anywhere. call for help. Help! There is no sign of anyone. Help me! Jordan is hoping that if he can reach one of the forest trails, he might encounter a hiker. The weather was still not exactly what you'd call ideal hiking weather, so I didn't really expect anyone to, to be out tramping around at that time. <laughs> I was so thirsty, every cell in my body was, you know, just dying for water. You can go without food for, uh, you know, a week or, or two, but uh, four days without any substantial amount of water, and you're not going to be around much longer. The rain-soaked ground chills Jordan to the core. But after nearly 100 hours without fluid, he grabs the chance to ease his parched thirst. I was just so thirsty, uh, I'd see a particularly uh, tasty looking droplet on the uh, edge of a blade of the grass. 
So I was basically just crawling around, licking the grass uh, for the water. And, uh, you know, if you found a cobweb that would have 20 or 30 uh, good-looking drops on it, I would pretty much just eat the cobweb. The toll from the climb up was pretty apparent, but I knew I had to keep going. So instead of looking at it as one big, long pull that I had to do, I would break it down into sections of about 10 pulls, and then I'd rest and give myself five or six seconds of rest and then go as hard as I could. Close to collapse, Jordan drags his broken body across the forest floor for six punishing hours. As the light starts to fade once again, Jordan claws his way to a picnic table. In spite of his agonizing injuries, Jordan has somehow dragged his shattered body on an epic journey of nearly two kilometers and up a sheer cliff. But now he's exhausted all his physical and mental reserves. I could feel that my health was getting worse. I couldn't go any further forward. Pretty much figured that uh, I wasn't gonna be making it out no matter what I did. Despite all his heroic efforts, Jordan Nikerti is convinced that at the age of 26, his life is ending. There was nothing to do but uh, lay there, wait for death, and uh, you know, think of all the people that I wasn't going to see again. <laughs> By some miracle, Jordan survives the night. As dawn breaks, he draws on his final ounce of strength and determination. Severely dehydrated and slowly dying of his injuries, he forces himself to go on in a last desperate bid for life. My plan on the, the fourth day was to get as close as I could to where the people might chance upon me. I was that close to death. All I could think was just keep pulling. The temptation to curl up and let go is overwhelming, but Jordan refuses to go quietly. It probably took me around two hours to get about 20 yards, so I was only maybe going five, six feet at a time and then passing out for 10 or 15 minutes. The physical reality had, had set in and there was really no more mind over matter to be had. There was no way I was going to uh, get to the trailhead or very much further for that matter because the distance I was able to go before passing out was just getting shorter and shorter. I was actually going to die very soon. Then he hears voices. He thinks the sound is hikers on a nearby trail. Help me, please. It was my first real help chance of, of rescue. Please help me. I yelled as loud as I could to attract their attention. Help, help. But Jordan's please yells help emerge as barely a whisper. Help me, please. The voices melt away into the trees. It just seemed like it was just the cruelest joke. I was thinking that was my chance. That was it. The despair I felt at getting so close to being rescued, I've never felt that much bleakness in my life. He starts to slip in and out of consciousness. Dreams and reality blurring into one another. Help. 
the sounds of voices return, just meters away. Help me, so I started yelling again. Help! Help! And me, just please. yelled and yelled at them. Help. This time, Jordan Help. can actually see hikers through the trees. But they're getting further away. Every step they were taking, they were taking my survival with them. Please help me! The last two people in the group were probably about two steps away from being out of sight behind these trees. And there's a lady in an orange rain jacket, and I could see her stop and sort of cock her head, and it, you know, she obviously had heard something. She started looking around and took a few steps back in, in my direction and finally saw me. As soon as she saw me, I just, uh, I can't even describe uh, how relieved I was. I just watched them run towards me and uh, just thought to myself, oh, I've done my part, I'm, I'm your problem now. It was beyond joy, it was beyond anything. This was, this was a chance at life again here. You hear me? You hear me? Jordan's four-day ordeal would have finished most people, but his stubborn refusal to give up saved his life. I came as close as you can get, I think, to, to dying, and um, it looked like I was gonna, gonna make it. Jordan was treated for a ruptured pancreas and internal hemorrhaging, injuries that could have killed him within hours. In a series of operations, surgeons fixed Jordan's shattered pelvis using 12 centimeter long titanium screws. He also needed major skin grafts to his legs and hands. Jordan recovered fully and enjoys life at home with his family. He lives every day as though it's his last. The only guarantee that we're given is that we will die. We can't pick when or how. The only thing we can affect is what we do with the time that we're given. I see my life now as something that is not to be squandered, even in the smallest amount.